Aloha and welcome to the Bear Wozniak Adventure where we believe that the most radical thing you can do in life is abandon yourself to the wild adventure of God's will. And you know, if you if you have abandoned yourself to God's will, get ready for get ready for the ride of your life. Uh, the life of faith is uh, is always demanding. Uh, uh, there's a lot of ad- adversity uh, involved in it, and uh, always a lot of adventure. Uh, I just got back from Hawaii. Cindy and I were in Cocoa Beach, Florida. Uh, are in Cocoa Beach, Florida now. We spent a few months at my home in Hawaii. It's just so good to be back and to see all, see all the Beach Boys and all the people that you know, all the people in the lineup. You know, so many people I see when I go out surfing that I never see on the land. It's just kind of funny. But we usually paddle out right in front of our house, and we'll maybe paddle out about a quarter of a mile to half a mile out to one of our favorite reefs uh, called Populars or Pops. And uh, either stand up paddle surf or tandem surf or snorkel, and we just had a great time. But I needed to get in shape. I was uh, with a cu- I was uh, on a trip last uh, summer or last fall to Greece and then Rome and then uh, Greece and Ireland and then Rome, and I ended up getting that horrible bronchitis, and I was sick for like three or four months. So being in Hawaii, I lost I think about ten pounds of the weight that I gained, and uh, I, I, I I stand up paddle surf. About 190 uh, miles so far. Uh, and now I'm in Cocoa Beach trying to keep up that pace, try to get strong and get in shape again. So we were on the road. The reason why we were taking all these trips is we were doing two things. We we're doing site trips uh, for future episodes of Long Ride Home Future Seasons. We'd still like to go back and do a season in Ireland, uh, the, wild, uh, the wild coast on the, on the west side. It would be really cool to shoot there. And then also we're considering doing uh, the threshold of the apostles, uh, starting at the southern part of Italy and going to all the places in Italy where the uh, where the relics, the remains of the apostles are, considering doing both of those for future seasons of Long Ride Home. And also, of course, we were doing our research uh, for leading uh, pilgrimages to uh, Rome and to Italy and to Ireland and and then earlier this year we did our little we did a little uh, search uh, in Greece. So. We basically, what we're saying is uh, we want to invite you to our first pilgrimage. I'm a really big fan of St. Paul, and our first pilgrimage that we're leading, it, we're doing it with 206 Tours. They're one of the best tour. Well, they're just amazing. They, they, over, they overdo what you would expect from them. You know, sometimes when you stop for lunch, uh, what the bus pulls over, and you go to have lunch at one of the great places they've located for you, and they bring wine for you, uh, for example, and just really great guides, really great hosts. And so we've, we're partnering with 206 Tours for our Footsteps of St. Paul pilgrimage. We're going to be doing a lot of it by bus, but we're going to be doing a few nights uh, on a cruise ship. We're actually going to be sailing from Greece over to Ephesus. Uh, we'll be staying on the cruise ship when we go to Ephesus. But we're gonna, And then we go from Ephesus to, me, to Patmos, to the island of Patmos, where where John was, and we get to go then to my two of my favorite islands, Mykonos, and then, of course, the beautiful Santorini. You know, Mykonos and Santorini are those two Greek islands that have the whitewashed walls with the blue uh, roofs. And, you know, the reason why they did that is when the, Tur- when the Ottoman Empire took over Greece, uh, they told them you can't fly the Greek flag anymore. So what they did is they made their houses into a flag by whitewashing them white and painting the rooftops blue, the same color of the flag. But anyway, we'll start off in Greece. Uh, we'll be going to Thessalonica, to Philippi, to uh, Athens, and to all, all the other, the, the, the most of the locations uh, that you see that Paul wrote his letters to. And I, I love St. Paul. I've been doing a lot of study. And my study this year is devoted to the book of Acts and to the life of St. Paul. You know, he was raised in a town called Tarsus, which is uh, maybe... Uh, about a three-week walk from Jerusalem, he he was uh, he was born uh, he was born a Roman citizen. Uh, his father was a Pharisee, and so was he. He was trained by Gamaliel, the greatest teacher of his time, which who in turn had been trained by Hillel, who was the greatest rabbi they say of all time. He lived to be over a hundred years old, and so he was steeped in the Pharisaical approach to life. He uh, lived in a town called Tarsus, which he said is no insubstantial town. It was right there near the Cilician Gates, right on the, the pathway where Rome, where east meets west, where caravans would go from the east uh, over to Rome. And so that area was, w- was full of commerce. So 
The language of commerce was Latin, so he spoke Latin. Uh, the country he lived in was was, Gre- uh, was Greece, so he spoke. Uh, well, he li- he lived near Greece, and so he he, he spoke Greek. He was very familiar, and you can tell by some of his writings, familiar with Plato, and so therefore all of the Greek uh, philosophers. He knew a uh, Greek poetry. He even quotes some of it when he spoke to the people in Athens, and uh, of course he spoke Aramaic and read the Hebrew scriptures. So this is a Paul. This is Paul, who was a highly educated man. But also, he was so uh, skilled in his trade uh, that he was a tent maker. He made goat hair tents. And goat hair tents are made by weaving goat hair together. A very, very long, uh, difficult thing to do, weaving the goat hair in two-foot-wide uh, um, segments. And that would be the whole length of those nomadic tents that you see. And what he did uh, when he traveled You'll remember uh, he worked. Uh, he worked when he traveled. Uh, he could take his tools in just a little bag. The tools that he used to stitch these long two-foot segments together, uh, he could carry with him very easily. It'd be like breaking, bringing your laptop with you today. And he would stitch this the the wool uh, one two-foot long uh, thing of wool to another two-foot long thing of wool, and he would stitch it together with a watertight seam. Uh, made with long leather strands. And this is really what St. Paul did. He, he, he connected the Old Testament with the New Testament in a watertight seal. Uh, but this man who was a Pharisee and had a zeal for God uh, was there when Stephen was, uh, when Stephen was martyred, and Stephen said, Lord, don't hold this against them. And in fact, the Lord didn't hold that against uh, St. Paul. And uh, St. Paul kind of picked up where St. Stephen, Stephen left off and went on his great missionary uh, journeys, ending, the, some, the tradition tells us he went as far away as, as Spain, uh, went to Rome. In fact, tradition tells us that Peter and Paul were martyred on the same day. St. Peter was crucified because he wasn't a Roman citizen, and St. Paul was beheaded. And I've been to the place where St. Paul was beheaded. So that's what this pilgrimage uh, in Paul's footsteps is all about. And we, we, uh, we want to invite you to join us you can go to the deepadventure.com website and check out a uh, pilgrimage tour to Greece. But I got to tell you guys something. If you uh, are listening to this on live radio, uh, we're glad you're hearing uh, the Bear Wozniak Adventure. A lot of people listen to our show on all the different podcast apps or shortwave radio. Uh, but we also have this show available on YouTube. So go to the Bear Wozniak YouTube channel and, and please subscribe. Uh, YouTube wants us to add 1,000 new sc- subscribers, and if we do that, They'll do some special promotion of our ministry. So if you would go to the YouTube channel, Bear Wozniak, and subscribe, it would be really cool. And if you were watching us on YouTube, you would see me wearing the coolest T-shirt in the world because it is displaying the T-shirt of the 2017 Waikiki Spam Jam. Uh, This is the ultimate in culture. There's no place else in the world you could possibly go then to the Waikiki Spam Jam to experience just the pure Russian beauty of people eating Spam prepared by all the different chefs and all the different uh, Waikiki musicians, unless, of course, you're in Rome. <laughs> and our guests today, John and Ashley Corona, uh, live in Rome. I got to meet, meet them in Rome, and they have this thing called the, they call it the Truth and Beauty Project.com. And I guess uh, I guess Ashley is the beauty part and John is the truth part. Maybe I'm not sure. But welcome to the Bear Wozniak adventure, John and Ashley. It's good to see you guys again. You guys were so gracious. Uh, we were visiting Rome and and to get to go visit uh, visit some people who can tell us a little bit what it's like to actually live in Rome. And you had this cool uh, group of people there. Uh, before we dive in, tell us a little bit about the the. Uh, Truth and Beauty Project, and then we'll talk a little bit more about your, uh, your, uh, your testimony and some of the other things we want to dig into. So tell us about the Truth and Beauty Project. Oh, please get to we Mystic. Need- I want <laughs> someone to get to Mystic. Let's go to Mystic. <laughs> Hold on. This is, we got to set out a warning. We want to warn everybody, uh, hide the women and children, because <laughs> John is about to get uh, dig into St. Thomas. Go ahead. We want to hear it. Uh, well, being uh, being an engineer too, I'm going to be technical in terms of being Thomistic and being technical in terms of how anything can know anything. And so, for Saint Thomas, 
the only way we as human beings know anything is through sense perception. So in order for us to know something, so let's say I have to know a pen. So the object has to first exist. And then there has to be a medium that's going to transfer that medium authentically as it is in order to a medium that I can use to perceive that object. So let's say the medium is water, then I'm not going to get the authentic image. The, Thomas would call it the accidentals of that thing. But if we have a medium like air, then the accidentals of that object are transferred to my sense perception. And based on how accurate my ability is to perceive that thing, I can get what St. Thomas calls a phantasm or fantasia. Those, those are different stages of having an apprehension or a concept of a thing. And that is presented to what he calls a passive intellect, meaning it just receives and doesn't do anything active with it. Okay, John, hold on a second. Hold on there, St. Thomas. <laughs> okay, so we're, we're, we got to get, we got to take a break here. Everybody get up and stretch and take a deep breath. Do a few push-ups while we're gone. We'll try to get get your, your mind restarted. I have to use a pull starter on my brain. Uh, maybe you use a kick starter, but we're, we're going to take a break. We'll come back and talk with John and Ashley. The, the way he's going with this conversation is exactly the way I hoped uh, Ashley and John would go. Because uh, I know my listeners, you know, we're spiritual, rational souls, and darn it, we're Catholic, so we got to be smart. Uh, and so we'll be back and talk about John and Ashley and their Truth and Beauty Project. This is Bear Wozniak. Go to our uh, Deep Adventure, deepadventure.com website, and you can find out all kinds of stuff about our ministry. Buy my books. Uh, you can ha access our Bear's Man Cave, where men can join up with us, our private Facebook group. We'll be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Oh, how many minutes is that? Okay, okay. Um, well, you know what, Shane? I'll just do that as a monologue. Okay, good. Because that was basically my monologue. Okay. Right when you're ready, Shane. Aloha, and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. We're here with John and Ashley Cor uh, Narona. <laughs> it's only the way I can remember their name is the rhymes with Corona. And uh, we're talking about the Truth and Beauty Project and their beautiful lives together in Roma, Roma, Italy. So ciao, ciao you guys. Ciao to you. What does ciao mean anyway? What, is, what, is, what does the word literally mean? Well, it's a great word because it means both hello and goodbye. So it comes in handy because that's one less word for, for people who are new to the Italian language to have to learn. So put like, that one in your back pocket. It's kind of like aloha. Aloha is hello and goodbye, but it actually means to give breath. So it actually means love. Yeah. So, hey, you guys, we were digging into St. Thomas Aquinas, and uh, you, talked about, uh, you were talking about man's ability to perceive beauty and how we actually, it comes in through our senses, our ability to to see and to know things comes in through our, our senses. Uh, and, you know, God made us, God made the material world. Here's a spiritual God made a material world. And he loves, he loves the material world. He loves humans. He loves the way he created us. Uh, but tell us more about what the difference is between mankind having a spiritual, rational soul vis-a-vis -vis the normal just uh, soul of, a, of an animal. Yeah, so to go back to the way we process information, so once we get the sense perception into the passive intellect, then the active or the agent intellect has to now translate that into what is a concrete object of reality. So truth is nothing but, but the correspondence of the reality of the thing with the perception we have of the thing in our mind. Now, there can be so many problems with perceiving the object. So what I mentioned is a medium that translate, transfers the object into our sense perception. Well, what if we have bad eyesight or bad hearing or any of the senses? What if we have good eyesight, but we don't have the optic nerve to trans, transfer that to the brain? 
And then what if we have what is called a condition called agnosia, where we don't have the ability. So let's say I, I talk about a pen, or let's say I show someone an iPhone, and I say, what is this? And if he has agnosia, he will say, well, it's an object with a black screen, and, yeah, and it has a, a white or whatever color case it has. And they don't know what it is. If you don't know what an iPhone is, then you won't be able to perceive that this can do so many so-called smart things. But nothing can be as smart as we are. That's why sometimes when someone says, oh, you're smarter than a computer, I'm like, well, that's not really a compliment. A computer <laughs> comes. You know, I, I love that. Being. Yeah, that's true. And, and a, computer the doesn't, I a computer up, doesn't understand beauty, really, does it? Exactly. And the reason I bring up these defects is because there's subjective and objective beauty. So let's say someone sees something like even, uh, uh, let's say a, a puddle on the, on the ground, and you say, that's not beautiful. Well, someone else with a good eye, like Ashley, mm -hmm. will see the reflection of a church stained glass in the puddle and take a photo of that. And I don't know why she's taking a photo of that, that puddle. And then when I see the, the after effect of her editing, I'm like, oh my gosh, that's beautiful. And so in terms of what makes something beautiful is if that object makes it so desirable to not just the external, but the inner eye. You know, and I gotta, that, go ahead. I got to tell you, know, lift up our souls. Lifts up our souls. So it's like, Ashley, I know like uh, when we were, when I work with videographers and I've been, I've had the pleasure of working with uh, David Pu'u, one of the greatest action videographers in the world for decades. And my son, uh, one of my sons is really great in videography. And uh, what's interesting is it's just like you described it. I'll be just walking along and suddenly they, 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 they run across the street, they run up a hillside, they dive on the beach and they grab something that I, I don't even see. And it's so beautiful to have people that have that mm -hmm. gift. What is it, Ashley? Um, do you think all people uh, have a creative, artistic gift, Ashley? Well, you know, Pope St. John Paul II in his letter to the artist speaks about the opportunity that we have all been given to make our lives a masterpiece. And I think that a lot, not a lot of people realize that they do inherently have an inner creativity. I mean, we have the opportunity to be co-creators with God in everything that we make. Now, what we're going to make out of that, that's the question. So I believe that we have that, but it has to be trained. And if we can, if we can harness that, and if we can move that towards objective beauty, towards harmony, towards uh, you know things coming together in congruency. Those are our elements of objective beauty. If we can do that- Can you then say those things again? What are the elements of, of, of beauty? What is it? The two of them that I just pointed out were harmony, things that come together in an, an objective order, also with congruency. Um, these, this is why things that are, are ordered Makes sense to us, attract us. There's this a, is why music. Yes, order is. Yeah, there's a yeah, and music. Back in the right. early days, you. I mean, we're going to talk more about ancient history. But when people said they studied music in the days of the of early Rome, and uh, they were actually studying mathematics more than they were learning how to play, the, you know, the flute. Right. The beauty of the order of music. It's a. It's it's a from an energy engineering point of view, like John. Right? It's mathematics. Music is mathematics. So, Ashley, I'm sorry. I kind of got what you're saying. The, the beauty, there's a certain beauty. When I read a, a book, an intellectual book, like when I read Thomas Aquinas, it's mm -hmm. he, a beautiful mind. Augustine, a right. beautiful mind. It's, so it's not like I'm looking at a sunrise, but my sure. mind loves that. You know, when my wife and I tandem surf together, you know, we, we're, we're paddling out the beauty of the ocean. Uh, we paddle for a wave. There's a synchronicity to the way we paddle. We drop mm -hmm. into the wave. We get up. She times kidding up. She comes back to me. I put her in a lift over my head. But everything is in order. I mean, the ability for us to be one with the wave, one with each other, and to and to move into that. To me, that's that's the beauty of it. People go, why are you? Why do you do that? Because it's the most beautiful thing I've ever experienced. Mm -hmm. Is to ride on a eight, ten foot face with my wife in an overhead lift, and her screaming as we go down the line. There's a beauty in that, you know, and, yes. I, and it's something unique about the human soul. But there, in that beauty, there's an order. There's a certain 
right. place I put my hand. There's a certain timing to the down up when she jumps. There's a certain mm -hmm. place her eyes focus to bring her into balance. Um, yeah. And in that challenge, uh, we find that beauty. So I'm sorry I kind of jumped on what you're saying. Go ahead. Well, and it's interesting, Bear, because right now in our modern world, there's sort of a push or a wave for what's called deconstructionism in art, for example. And that is the opposite. That's a hodgepodge of things. And of course, that that's hard for us to take in because it's not natural to the way our minds work. But instead, if we can learn to to nurture that creativity with which we all are born and inherently have within us, then we truly can fulfill what Pope St. John Paul II has asked of all of us, which is to make our lives a masterpiece. And people might think, oh gosh, I'm not an artist per se. And you don't have to do it through an artistic pursuit because we are building and creating all the time. And that's our personal challenge. What's our Sistine Chapel in our lives going to be? And it could be your family. It could be the, the way that you show charity to those around you. I mean, there's so many ways that we all can make a masterpiece of our lives there. I, I know like in, in, my, in my ninja days when I, when I trained in martial arts, <laughs> wow. it was beautiful. You know, to be mm. able to have someone attack you <laughs> with a knife and be able to just elegantly perceive it mm. uh, and just with a flip of their wrist, throw them on the ground and disengage them. There's a, there, was a, there was a beauty in the elegance of the minimal amount of work that had to be done to counter that and all of the body mechanics that went with it. You know, when you, walk, when you see a ballerina or when you see uh, even to me, when I remember I was in college, every night. Uh, we were in a dorm at Baylor, believe it or not, where the women had to go in at 10.30. The men got to stay up all night. <laughs> and we would go out and play football at 10.30 at night. And to me, the, we would practice over and over again throwing this perfect football pass where the guy had to have his arms totally extended, and he would have to look back over his head to catch the football. We would work on that for, for months and try to accomplish this perfect, beautiful okay. moment. You know? So, yeah, there's, there, is the, there is this beauty in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in order. So I wanna, we're going to take a little segue here now because I, I wanted to get a little bit into how you guys met. We, don't have, uh, we only have a couple of minutes left of this segment. Who, how did you two, guys, you two characters find each other? Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. John and I were friends for five years before we actually started dating. And we met in the good old city of Philadelphia. We ran in the same circles for those five years. You were running in and circles. That's how you did it. <laughs> we were running in circles. Okay, well, listen, we're going to be right back with more of this story. I realize we're really up against a hard break here. So you were running in circles. Okay, their advice, if you haven't found the true love, is to go to Philadelphia and run in circles. Uh, this is Bear Wozniak. We'll be back with more of the Bear Wozniak adventure. We need to invite uh, the women to go to our website, deepadventure.com, and sign up your man in your life, whether it's your son or or brother-in-law, or husband, or father for the for Bears Man Cave. It's one of the coolest things. Uh, no one else is doing what we're doing. Uh, they, we have a private Facebook group where the men challenge, equip, encourage, mobilize each other. And then, like tonight, when I'm when I'm done uh, taking my surfs, I'm gonna sit down on my lanai, light a cigar, have a shot of whiskey, and about 20 of us are gonna have a Zoom video chat together, and we get to see each other and talk story back and forth and get to know each other. And we're seeing through the Bears Man Cave a lot of men's lives be radically changed and a lot of ministries being launched. So go to deepadventure.com. Men, sign yourself up or women, sign up your husbands or men in your life. This is Bear Wozniak. We will be right back with more of the Bear Wozniak Adventure. Aloha and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak, and we, ha we have a really cool <clears throat> guest with us today, uh, John and Ashley and Narona. But before we do that, I, I, I've got to tell you guys, we're really excited about what's happening with uh, Long Ride Home. It looks like our TV series, you know, it was, it was aired on EWTN. In fact, it still is airing on EWTN every Tuesday night at 11 o'clock Eastern time. Our 28-minute episodes, you know, of our 10-episode reality TV show of men uh, rolling thunder on motorcycles across the United States and seeking out brotherhood, seeking to understand the virtues and to go deeper with God. But guess what? 
It was also on the Armed Forces net, net, uh, Network. But it turns out that it looks like Amazon Prime and iTunes will have it up here uh, within just a matter of days, maybe before you even hear this. Uh, you'll be able to uh, uh, just tell your friends, watch Long Ride Home on iTunes. I think we're the only show that's ever gone from EWTN to a platform like that. And we were in, in Rome this, uh, this last uh, September and met with Monsignor Gino there at the Vatican, and he said, there's no one else doing this. A lot of people are really good at, at reaching people inside the church, but you guys are going outside the walls and reaching people who might never have heard the gospel from a credible witness. And when you, when you see you know, guys rolling thunder across the whole USA on motorcycles, uh, that gives them the street cred with men to, uh, to speak. And then when you, you hear the transparent testimonies of their lives, because some of it is quite gut-wrenching, uh, we have the ability to share the gospel in, a, in an incredible way. So um, I think I said earlier, you might have missed the beginning of the segment. You can watch this show on YouTube now. Where If you go to the Bear Wozniak channel, we're begging you, go there and subscribe to it because YouTube has told us they're going to ramp up the, uh, their promotion of our site as soon as we add 1,000 more people. So go to Bear Wozniak and watch the show on YouTube, and you'll get to see me uh, wearing my blue uh, Waikiki 2017 Spam Jam T-shirt. Uh, celebrating the height of Waikiki culture, where we shut down Kalakaua Avenue and all the chefs make their greatest spam uh, dish. And we have all of our musicians down there. I think the only thing that comes close to being as sophisticated when it comes to art and culture as Waikiki on Spam Jam Night is Rome. And that is why we have John and Ashley Nerona with us and their Truth and Beauty Project. Aloha, you guys. Welcome back. Aloha, Aloha and a big ciao. Ciao, yeah. And so I was asking them how these two characters meet because they're just, there's something really sacred about their relationship. And Ashley told me that the key was to go to Philadelphia and run around in circles. I don't, you want to clarify right. that for me? <laughs> well, exactly. Yes, I better clarify that. We met in Philadelphia, and for five years, we were friends running in the same social circles. Uh, except social we, circles? <laughs> Yes. That's very sophisticated. Okay. Circles, exactly. It was the same Catholic circles of friends. And so we have this beautiful friendship. It was based on really helping each other discern the way that God was calling each of us. And we both had a passion for young adult ministry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so after five years of friendship, one day, Bear, I got a phone call from a, a friend of Johnny's, who John, who I'd only met a couple of times. And she called and invited me to her wedding. And I was so happy to be able to accept and that she would think of me. What I didn't realize was that she and Johnny were working behind the scenes. And uh, so I, I accepted, we went to this, to this wedding. I went with John and sure enough, uh, after the mass, he brought me over to, so he said he had something important to show me. And there was a statue of Christ as the good shepherd with the sheep over his shoulders. And maybe just back up a little to talk about the timing. Because oh, we want to, John, all the men want to know, men want to learn from John how to do this. So that's let's hear, right. let's hear well, the you know, story, John. Go ahead. The well, I just wanted to add a little bit to go back to my the way my engineering mind works. So numbers are important to me. So during a, con a random conversation with Ashley's mom in Philadelphia, I heard that Ashley's birth time was 3.33 p.m. And so I had decided that I wanted to ask her this question at exactly 3.33 p.m. And things were not going too well because the mass that was supposed to begin at 2 p.m. wasn't beginning till 2.10, 2.15, 2.20, 2.30. And then the priest very proudly tells us that the couple never intended to begin at 2.30, at 2 o'clock, always 2.30. They just didn't want anyone to be late with the New Jersey traffic. So now you can continue with the rest. So of poor John. So the mess finishes, and it's just it's about three thirty one and a half. We're just up against the deadline. So he quickly takes me, shows me the statue of Christ as the Good Shepherd, and he said, "I've brought you here because I want to tell you that I want to be your John Ten." says, I want to be your good shepherd and to be able to someday present you to the Lord as a spotless, unblemished lamb. And 
of course, this was beautiful. And it was out of the blue. John had been discerning this, but I was still in the friendship land. And so uh, I was able to give him a let's think about it kind of answer. And about three days later, I changed my tentative yes to an affirmative yes. After I'd had the chance for the head, the heart, for everything to catch up. And we realized very quickly that because of our beautiful friendship of five years, we had already done a lot of the hard work just by virtue of friendship. We knew each other's characters. We had trust built up. What we, the only thing we had left to do was to fall in love. And you know that that can be fast. So we got married five months later, and Bear, we've just celebrated 10 years of marriage. It, what, that's great. That's just awesome. Yeah. And so obviously going prior to that, you guys had a deep walk with the Lord. Were both of you guys uh, raised in the church, or how did, how did your conversions work? Tell, 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 give us the backstory a little bit. Mm -hmm. So in my case, I was uh, raised as, I guess, a nominal Catholic so going to church, doing all the regular things. I went to a Jesuit school, but didn't really have ownership of my faith. And then I went to engineering college, and that's when all the challenges began. We had all kinds of missionaries coming to the dorms, and pretty much everyone would tell me how the Catholic Church had it all wrong, and they had the truth. They had it right. So eventually, it was getting challenged, and I was kind of losing hope because I would go to the local priest and ask them, Father, could you tell me where I can find this in the Bible or how I can find the reason behind this or that belief? And I wasn't really getting it. Then one weekend I went home and I had a really strict dad. There was no negotiating, bargaining or anything with him. He was a true man of virtue and character. And he, when he had rules, uh, they were meant to be followed if we were under his roof. And so uh, the rule was that we had to get to the 8.30 mass, but he would leave at about five minutes to eight. And if we were not ready on time, we would be in big trouble. So the idea was that when you go to mass, you don't just show up. It's like when you go to a basketball or a football game, you just don't show up and start playing. You have to get warmed up. So anyway, it's 7.45 and I'm still at the breakfast table and I just get this look from him and I said, don't worry, don't worry, I'm not going to make you all late. I am not coming to church. So I got this kind of look, but then he really helped me put things in perspective. After I told him why it was that I was planning on not going, I said I had all these questions, the priest didn't give me the answers, and so I'm thinking I need to take a break. So he said, well, what kind of an engineer are you? If you had questions about something in science, like gravity, and your professor couldn't explain it, are you going to take a break from science and claim that gravity doesn't exist? You go to a library, look it up. When it comes to your faith, why are you expecting to be spoon-fed? And this was wow. something I... Really I got to meet your dad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, that's and so then cool. I said, yeah, faith has eternal consequences, and my engineering didn't really. And so he gave me four minutes to run up, dress, polish my shoes, and come down. And during that time, I was scrambling to get ready, but this was really sinking in. And this was before mm -hmm. Google, the internet, or anything. So I basically started the search and the pursuit for truth and started going from one library to, to the other. And then after a long journey, came right back to the church. But by this time, I felt that I really owned my faith. Mm -hmm. And what do you mean? Uh, what did you, what was it that, like for me, it was finding the early church fathers and then finding Augustine and then finding Aquinas. It was like that grounded me. Uh, what was it that kind of, what was your, you got to keep it brief, John, but what was your journey that you were on that, that, um, that brought you back? You said you went to library after library, went different places. What books were you reading? Were you looking into other religions or other philosophies or what was it? Because I, but what was it? Just know what, what, what was the fullness of truth. So I looked into all religions and then I came back to Christianity and then realized there's so many denominations. And then finally did a little of everything. The church fathers, technology was my friend, and so I used technology as much as I could, using Bible works to look at biblical, the translations from different languages, reading church history. Mm -hmm. uh, the fathers were a part of it, but I guess a major part of this was uh, mainly Thomistics because it made a That's lot of what sense. I was and, say. It's got to yeah. be a Thomas and his beautiful mind. 
it, it has to be the Thomistics with you uh, and your love for philosophy. And you, and you must love Aristotle, too, then. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, okay, don't just say, mm, this is a radio show. <laughs> so you have this love for, uh, for philosophy, which I love about the Catholic Church. You know, some of the early church fathers called Aristotle and Plato and Socrates saints. You know, the, their, their ability to reason and think and with the rational mind, come to a basic understanding of of God, not not through revelation, not as deeply as we know, but there was this joining of the Greek thinking uh, with the uh, the Jew, the Hebrew and Christian understanding of revelation, and we all met on a Roman road someplace, you know. So so the beauty of Saint Thomas, uh, what was it? What was there a moment when it was just like it was like an aha moment, or did it take? Was it like um, uh, just a gradual accumulation of thought? Well, after getting to the highest levels in technology, leading the technology initiatives group, what I realized was that I couldn't defend the faith because all these other other agnostics and atheists were using philosophy and psychology. So eventually it took about two years of wrestling with God to finally give up my dream job and then do a master's in philosophy and that led to theology. But I guess my aha moment was uh, going back to Socrates, who was accused of being an atheist, but he believed in all the gods. And his question was, you, went, you were talking about goodness there, and he asked the same question, what is good? What makes something good? Is something good because the gods say so? Or is it good irrespective of whether the gods say it is or whether the gods do so? Because the gods, you know, were not really practicing and engaging in virtue. Gods against gods. Okay, gods we're going to get into that in our next segment. Can we come right back and talk about that? That's where we want to go next. Absolutely. We're going to talk about the, the, the thought about virtue. This is Bear Wastick with the Bear, Bear Wastick Adventure. We'll be right back with more. Aloha, and welcome back to the Bear Wozniak Adventure. I'm your adventure guide, Bear Wozniak. And, uh, you know, we have all kinds of crazy people on our show. We have surfers, <laughs> bikers, uh, I don't know, every kind, of ma- every kind of person you can imagine. And uh, usually they're knuckle draggers like me, but today we, I'm, I shouldn't say that about my guests. But uh, today we're, we are, have two beautiful people. We have truth and beauty in our midst. Um, we have... Uh, John and Ashley Norona, who have the Truth and Beauty Project.com. And we've been discussing uh, basically uh, John's conversion, his return to the Lord, and, it, and it, that, that it was philosophy and Thomistic thinking that helped you return. Give us that. We got one more segment because I want to get to the next subject. Give us the highlight of that, John. So, yeah, going back to the idea of what is right belief, orthos doxos. So if something was right belief, then it always had to be consistent and true at all times, no matter what. Not true sometimes and not true mm-hmm. too, true at other times. So uh, initially it was also uh, reading St. Augustine because in his soliloquies, he is having a dialogue between himself and his reason. And he begins by asking himself, well, do I even know myself? What do I know about other things? How can I know? So he says, my friend Simplicianus. So I think I know him really well, but I don't know his thoughts. I don't know anything internal. And then he came to himself and he realized that he thought he knew himself. He said, but then I had a list of things I wanted to do the next day. The day came, the day day went, and then he didn't end up doing the things that he did or not doing what he didn't want to do. So he eventually concludes that we don't even know ourselves, and finally, it's only God who truly knows us and can re- reveal what His purpose is for us. And that is the so, bonum. You talked about Socrates' uh, goodness is fulfilling what you were meant to be, your final cause. Mm-hmm. And wrap this up because I want to ask you another question. I ask you guys another question. You were, I thought you had wrapped it up. You have one more thought, John. And so you said. 
When so, for Socrates, it was all about the pursuit of virtue and that which could truly fil fulfill us and lead us to the idea of the forms or whatever it was that Plato had conceived of. That was where we fell and where we had to go back. And so it was, how do you do that? And then that's where Augustine takes it in the city of God from a Neoplatonic to a totally Christian ideal. So now, now I want to segue into this. So Aristotle said that if, um, uh, basically that the path to happiness was to follow the virtues. And they had the four virtues, the, the cardinal virtues, the cardus, the hinge virtues of justice, self-mastery, as I call temperance, uh, prudence, and fortitude. But then the Christian uh, virtues of faith, hope, and love were introduced, well, really pro promulgated by, by Paul as he understood, you know, of course, the Lord. What, talk to us about, you, you guys, why don't you talk to us about this, what virtue, the, the difference in the virtue in those day, days and age and, 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 and what vis-a-vis -vis what the, the Christian church brought. For example, the virtue of humility, the, the virtue of, of justice towards God. Or, or just humbleness with other people was considered um, kind of a uh, uh, a virtue no one would really want to have. What, just describe to us the difference of virtues before and after Christianity began to have its impact. Well, take for example, so any one of those virtues you talked about, the virtue of humility. So for the Romans, humility was not just being self-deprecating. Very often people think humility is what we would call false humility. So take, for example, Michael Jordan is complimented. Oh, you're really a great basketball player. And he's trying to be all humble and say, oh, I'm really not that great. Well, imagine what it is for those who are not as good as him to feel like they are nothing. And so the idea of humility is acknowledging what it is that So this is in a Christian sense. What it is that you have done to accomplish what you've achieved or what has been given to you so that you could be who, who you are. And so that's why the true sense of humility and not false humility is if someone says, Bear, you're a great surfer, and you just say, praise God. Thank God for giving me the gifts, for giving me the people in my life, for giving me whatever it took to be this great surfer. That is true humility. So Humilitas, humilitas for the Romans was, again, not if you were self-deprecating, no one would look up to you, and then you wouldn't have honor and respect in people's eyes. So that's why if you just told people exactly who you were and what you were and what you were good at, that was being, being, being humble. So humility and honestas, or honesty, or veritas went together. So if you just speak the truth about who and what you are, and how it is that you accomplished and became what you are, that was true humility. And then Christian humility, oh, unless you want to say something, I can then no, go ahead. the next. I was, going to ask you, I was going to ask you what you were just about to go to, it sounds like. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> so then you come to Christian humility. So then you, you consider something like uh, Philippians 2, 6 to 10. So God, who is everything without absolutely any limitation, and didn't need to come down to any level, now, he stoops to come down to the level of man. Augustine compares this. He said, if you want to understand what this is and even wrap your minds around, the person who created everything that the universe cannot contain decided to take on a limited, vulnerable human nature. And he said that would be equivalent, even though analogy never ever comes close, to humans wanting to redeem antness. And we take on the form and nature of an ant that is trampled on without us even knowing about that. And that's why whenever we pray the creed and we say he was born of a virgin and became man, we bow our heads acknowledging what a great sacrifice that was. But not only did he do, do that, he takes on our human nature and then he dies. Well, actually, even when he took on our nature, he could have come as a king and emperor, but no, he came as the, the most humble, simple, vulnerable little baby in a manger. And then in when he cave, died... A stinky cave, basically. In a stinky cave, not a man cave, but in a stinky cave. And then when he died a, a death for us, it could have been a simple death, could have been beheading, could have been something more noble, but it was the most despicable human death from both a Roman and a Jewish perspective, because cursed is a man who is hung upon a tree. And it is through that sense of coming down that 
he is now exalted to have a name that is above every other name at which every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. So it's by coming down that he raised so you're himself saying God up. Ha God has a, has a humility too. Yeah, and that's so humble the himself and become man. Right? Absolutely, okay, yeah. Good. I, so, thought I, I thought I missed you there for a minute. Go ahead. <laughs> and so, Ashley, let me ask you a question. Is, is John a humble guy? Yeah, in <laughs> fact, it, it's interesting because I really feel that John, my hero, I, I, I learn so much from him every day. And it's, it's an amazing thing to be able to live with someone who you admire and who makes you better. And so, yes, John is definitely a man of virtue. And in fact, when I was praying to, to find my husband, to be led to my husband, I prayed for the intercession of St. Joseph, the perfect husband and father, St. Anthony, a saint who is very dear to my heart. And I prayed that this man have the virtue of St. Thomas More, have the character of St. Thomas More. But tell us about and Thomas was, More. Tell us about Thomas More. What well, Thomas More... So he, of course, who uh, ultimately went to his death refusing to, uh, to you know, waver in his beliefs. And that's what I, that was what made such an impression on me. That was the kind of man who I wanted to be around. And I feel that the Lord has definitely answered my prayers. Well, you know, the, 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 we're running out of time now, but the, the advent of Christian virtue, St. Paul, uh, they said that which they turned the world upside down. The world in some place, some of the cities he was in was lascivious, uh, promiscuous. Um, the culture was turned upside down by Christian virtue. And when we hear today, here today we hear these virtue signalers out there. The people are saying you have to be tolerant of everything except for people that believe there's such a thing as an absolute truth or absolute moral values. These people who take offense at everything, that's kind of a, a, a twisting and, uh, going way over the top of the basic Christian teachings that came from, uh, that changed the world into the Western world that it is today, the, the world of virtue, especially of faith, hope, and love. We're talking with John and Ashley Nerona. They have the truthandbeautyproject.com website. We'd ask you to go visit them there. I, I had the pleasure of meeting them and having lunch at their house in Rome. And there was just something sacred about this couple. I just, uh, and as you said, Ashley, you know, when I met John, I go, Oh, there's more. There's 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 a lot of it's like the tip of the iceberg. I better he barely got to say a few words to me while I was there. And I go, I got to have these guys on my show. It took us long enough to have you back to be on the show. Right. Well, we're glad that we got to reconnect. <laughs> well, we hope to see you guys in Rome again, too. It's John and Ashley on, Verona yeah. at the Truth and Beauty yeah. Project. Yeah, we'd love to be back there <clears throat> in the next couple of years. Uh, this is mm -hmm. the Bear Wozniak adventure that you've been listening to. We bring you an eclectic mix of all kinds of guests, and that's why our show is the best show in the history of mankind, because our guests are the best the best uh, type of guests we can possibly have. We invite you to go to our website, the bear, uh, to the deepadventure.com website. My book, Deep in the Way of a Surfing Guide to the Soul, and my other book, Deep Adventure, the Way of Heroic Virtue, are available for you. You can buy the DVD sets of Long Ride Home. Don't forget to go to our YouTube page, and you can subscribe to our radio show, because it's available. It's not just a sound, an audio recording that we post to YouTube, but it's a video. So you can see how beautiful John and Ashley are together. You guys, thanks for being on the Bear Wozniak adventure. Well, oh, pleasure, Bear. yes, it's wonderful to be with you. And as we say in Italy, arrivederci. arrivederci. And as we say in Hawaii, aloha, ahui ho. Uh, God bless you guys. God bless you. Thank you, Bear. Take care.